was an amazingly researched uh, <laughs> uh, intro. Uh, I, I'm honored to be asked to give this talk, and uh, I was told to aim this not at mathematicians uh, or specialists, but I see that there are some specialists in the audience, and therefore I'd like to apologize to everyone else because I'm going to talk to them. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what, what I'd like to talk about is sort of uh, um, a thread that's been going through that uh, connects everything I've been thinking about for um, at least the past 30 years, and I didn't really, um, and it's sort of a, a geometrical way, a, well, let me not say what it is and, and hopefully just show you what it is, and hopefully this will make some sense. Uh, okay, so... Um, when you put in topology onto Google, this is what you get. It's a noun. Uh, it's a part of mathematics. It studies the geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by continuous change of shapes or figures. Okay? Uh, so, uh, but this is what everyone popularly knows. A topologist is someone who doesn't know the difference between a coffee cup and a donut. <laughs> okay? And uh, Peter Lacks told me a much, less, much more colorful version. Uh, okay. uh, for those not in the know, the point is that this coffee cup, right, the, the part of the cup that holds the coffee, to a topologist, that's just a blob. And then you could take, if you imagine that blob as made out of clay, then you easily would turn it into a donut, right, not caring at all um, about the precise geometrical shapes. Uh, you, have that remember, are you have to remember to include the handle. You have to remember to include the handle, right. I mean, it's just, right, so people, you know, so a topologist can tell the difference between a cup and a donut, okay? Uh, can't tell the difference between a cup and an apple, okay? So, so this has some implications, right? It means that small perturbations don't matter to a topologist, right? I mean, if you were to, you know, think about that surface, but you don't have a very, very precise measurement about where exactly each point on the surface is, Right? I mean, the whole definition is that such small perturbations uh, don't make a difference. Which, and this has applications if you're going to be qualitative as opposed to quantitative. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Rutherford <laughs> thinks that qualitative is nothing but poor quantitative. Uh, some other people think that quantitative is just anal qualitative. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right, I mean, uh, but I think that the theme of topology is that actually know that there are direct ways of making qualitative conclusions, not just as a result of making quantitative measurements with error. Okay? It's supposed to be a sort of, it gives you a set of adjectives and measurements that you can take that deal directly with things at a qualitative, in a qualitative way. Okay? Um, so by the way, to a topologist, the typical thing you talk about is a space. So if you want to think of it as an object or anything like that, I'll use the word space. Uh, for that, okay? So this is one of the kind of things that topologists like to measure. They like measuring uh, the holes in the space. So now I'm going to imagine the space consists entirely of these dots, okay? And to a topologist, this is a set, one sees these dots as having a bunch of zero-dimensional holes, <coughs> okay? Um, and the technical word is that H0 is whatever the number of dots you see. Well, it's Z to that number. And well, which is the space? The, dots? the space is the dots. The, space is the black. Dots. The black is the space. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, that's actually another good example. I could think about the white as the space. So if we think of the black as the space, then it has zero dimensional holes. Now, what do we mean by that? If I put a point here and a point there, I can't fill it in entirely inside the space. So since I use two points and points are zero dimensional, whatever dimension means, Okay, then that has a zero-dimensional hole. Okay, if we look at, at the white as being the space, then it has one-dimensional holes, right? Just the circle you would draw around one of these. Okay? Um, I think this is based on the book called Holes, or movie by that title. Uh, so if you were just thinking about the surface of this, this would be having one-dimensional holes. If you think about this the way it looks, as sort of something with depth, it has no holes at all. Okay? Okay, right, so this is an example, right, I mean, from some point of view, right, I mean, you know, you just take these things and you smush them down and you flatten it, and there's really nothing at all there, okay. Um, Swiss cheese, 
gives you an example. If you just look at a slice, you tend to see one-dimensional holes, but you realize that the cheese itself has two-dimensional holes, right? This ends up being half of the part of the cheese that it, that it came from. Okay, so that's what homology is. And it's sort of a good example of something that you don't really have to know everything. You could squish it and pull it, et cetera. And then topologists have ways of computing this. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what those ways are. But there are ways of computing it. And it's a way of, even if you don't know where everything is, it's a rough thing you could say about a space. Okay? Okay? Um, and it's useful. The fact that we have adjectives of this sort means that it, it's helpful in other areas where you want to be discussing things. So when people talk about the large-scale structures of the universe, frequently they'll talk about voids and walls and clusters and filaments. <coughs> and a lot of this could be interpreted as one-dimensional homology classes and two-dimensional homology classes and things like that. And you know, uh, certain cosmological models are in fact measured by doing estimates of the homology of various objects that would be predicted um, in this way. So right, these kind of pictures, right? This has a very, very. This is um, a picture I, of course, took from Wikipedia, which is where most unattributed pictures come from. <laughs> and right, and you know, this is some kind of large-scale picture of the universe at some scales. And in order to describe this, to have an, even a set of words for describing what these kind of things, topological, uh, topological terminology is useful. So it provides an adjective, a set of adjectives um, uh, for speaking. Another kind of thing that we like to talk about is dimension. Okay, So right, that's a line. It has dimension one. I think no surprises there. Okay, right. Um, this part here is a two-dimensional object inside the three-dimensional space. So this is the linear theory of dimension, uh, um, right? Where these things are planar or you know or associated to vector spaces, things like that. That's a very classical theory. To, okay, the surface of, of a ball that's a two-dimensional object. Okay, although the ball is embedded in three-dimensional space, right? The surface. Okay, a, an informal feeling is that. Um, that topological dimension is a local thing. It's something that you measure anywhere on your space. Okay, and then certainly locally, uh, uh, you know, if you're on the surface of the Earth, you think you're on a plane, as we did for many centuries. Okay, um, but uh, for example, if you wouldn't do things that way, then you would think that the Klein model, okay, might be four-dimensional because it doesn't fit inside of three-dimensional space. Okay, but, you know, to a bug living on a Klein model, it, you know, until it begins taking very large motions, it doesn't know that it's not living on a sphere or on a, or on a bagel or many other things. There are different other kinds of dimensions. This is a fractal dimension. Um, and uh, such dimensions are more geometrical in nature. Okay? I mean, uh, but I, I don't want to be too doctrinaire about the difference between topology and neighboring fields for the purpose um, of this talk. Uh, there are notions of entropy. Uh, which uh, those come up in dynamic. Uh, they will be coming up later. These are, again, numerical invariants um, of things that have a topological feel. And uh, if it's as appropriate, I'll talk about them later. So now let me tell you what my goals are in this talk. So I first want to, right, so so far I talked about topology as a source of adjectives. Okay? Mm -hmm. What I want to first do is give you a little bit of a feeling of what topological reasoning is. First, topological reasoning outside of topology and then topological reasoning for topology, okay? Um, and then, uh, and then sh shift the point of view and try to make topology more quantitative than qualitative, even though I've been, uh, the usual trip is that it's a qualitative part of math. By making it, there are advantages to making it quantitative and there are many, many challenges in making it quantitative. And what I'd like to do is, a way more is not understood than is understood, and I'll just, try to lay out some of the difficulties and maybe a drop of the dreams uh, in that direction. Okay, so let me start off with topological thinking. So this, is, this theorem says, on a desert island with a volcano, two or more castaways, so like Gilligan and uh, the skipper, uh, cannot reasonably agree where to place their atoms. Okay, so the, the job, right, so you have this mental picture. Okay, you have these two guys on this island, Okay? They, each are, they each take a vote about where to put the outhouse. Okay? Now, if there wouldn't have been a volcano, 
then, right, I mean, then the island is topologically a disk. Okay? And on a disk, you could reasonably decide what to do if, if, you know, in, a, in a fair way. You make your choice, I make my choice, and then I just take the, the line segment between them and choose the midpoint. Okay? But of course, with that volcano in the middle, that might lead to a catastrophic conclusion. Okay? So here are the axioms. Okay? Uh, this follows uh, uh, a paper of Graziella Cipollinsky, uh, who was uh, motivated by arrows and possibility theorem. Okay? And so we assume democracy. That doesn't depend on which of the two people uh, vote. We throw away, I mean, I don't know how you would actually do this in an island where there are just two voters, et cetera. But, but anyway, so there's secret balloting, uh, continuity. So that, that's where the topology comes in. Okay, so that, and the story that one would tell is that it would be irrational. You don't imagine that if people are going to be modifying their decision slightly, that you want to come to a really different conclusion. And if you were going to criticize the model, I think that would be a, something that you do. And then the final axiom is unanimity. Okay, that if both parties agree on where to put the outhouse, you actually put it there. Okay, so those would be the axioms for this kind of so, uh, problem. And okay, now I want to think about this topologically. Why is this impossible? Okay? So firstly, uh, we'll think about the island as being this annulus. Okay? And we'll see that actually, instead of studying the whole annulus, one just studies a circle within the annulus. Okay? And now the reason is this. Why is that enough? <coughs> if I throw out a circle inside of that annulus, and suppose that I could solve this problem in the annulus. Then if my two guys were on the circle, and the conclusion wasn't on the circle, right? I would have a solution in the annulus, okay? then I would just project further down. right? There's a projection from the annulus down to the circle. So I might as well, instead of studying the problem on an island, just study the problem you know, on a circle, just on a circle, okay? right? Uh, which would, again, I think, from the political point of view, right? one would, you know, if this were viewed as a problem of political theory, that might be an unusual step. Okay? So now this is what the space of preferences looks like to a topologist. It's a pair of circles. So this is, this is, in fact, the surface of the torus. Okay? And now the topologist can, can forget about the order in which uh, those two things are taken. Okay? So that would correspond to, we've built an abstract space. Okay? Uh, this is sometimes called the quotient space construction. Okay? If I have something and I have a symmetry, right, where this is my space, I could build a space where I just identify, where a point in the new space corresponds to a pair of points in the old space, a point and its symmetric variant. Okay? So a point in this Mobius strip, and this is a Mobius strip, in fact corresponded to two points on the torus, Okay? If they would be theta comma phi and phi comma theta. Okay? And okay, I, which is again sort of uh, an interesting feature for this idea of building abstract spaces where the points are, you know, are what it, represent whatever it is you want. And now, in terms of this, what are we trying to do? The aggregation method asks for a map of the Mobius band on to its boundary. Okay? So here you're having the Mobius band. That's a set of all preferences. The boundary, now that's, by the way, a different kind of point than all the points on the interior. Right? If you have a, a point on the Mobius strip, at this point, a little ant thinks it's living on a plane. Okay? But at a point on the boundary, it thinks it's living on a half space. Right? So there's, there really are different kinds of points in the different parts of the Mobius band. And what you're asking is, for every point here, you want to assign it a value over here on the boundary. Because after all, at the, after the election, both parties having agreed to, be, to the rule of law will be happy with the conclusion, right? So that will be something they can both agree to. Okay? So you're asking about for a map. You're trying to stretch the Mobius band. Not stretch it, you're trying to deform it. You're trying to push it, down, push it back to the boundary. Okay? And that's what this problem asks for. And that turns out to be impossible by somehow from the theory of holes. Okay? There's a one-dimensional hole in this Mobius band, right, to the center of the Mobius band is a one-dimensional circle. The boundary is also a one-dimensional circle, but this turns out to be impossible because the boundary goes around twice. So you sort of have to be able to divide this center circle in two in order to be able to get it to go to the boundary. Okay, okay let me give you a second uh, bit of topological reasoning, okay? 
Um, anyway, were there any questions about that? I mean, I mean, well, why wouldn't they have been happy with a point and a circle in the middle of the Mobius band? Oh, well, that's a point where they're disagreeing, right? That right. This car is right. That car responds to a pair of preferences, right? One, right. Oh, I, oh, I see. It's not a, okay. Got it. Right. Yeah. I mean, of course, we could agree to disagree, but then we don't have a math problem. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm in favor of conflict for, for the purposes of today's talk. Yeah, no, right, so anyway, so, right, so that's the initial po point is the point on the Mobius strip, right? The boundary is, ex is where, is, is exactly when they're agreeing, right? So we're trying to go from the Mobius band to the, to the boundary, okay? So here's, here's sort of a, um, a second uh, version. And this is, I think, this is sort of what I think of as typical topological reasoning. You're coming out, here we're proving something doesn't exist. It's a qualitative yes, no question. Okay? Okay? Um, so the statement is that you can't do long term predictions on, on the position of an abstract pentagon. Okay? So uh, let me just. Okay? I hope this isn't so bad. So by an abstract pentagon, I just mean that I have five vertices I could imagine having the lines, and I'm told the edge lengths. Okay, and these are what are preserved, but I'm going to ultimately, you know, these agents are going to be moving around, but always maintaining the same distance from each other. Okay, <laughs> I have no idea why one would want to do this. Okay, but I mean, there are roboticists who tell me that sometimes one might want to do this, uh, but I'm not, but I'm just interested in this for, you know, just for uh, the spiritual uh, interpretation of it. When you say maintaining the same distances, you mean sequentially? Sequentially, yeah. They, these are labeled things, and just yeah, each one has is told just in, you know to the, his two neighbors. Okay. In, yeah, not all five, not all the distances of all the points. Mm -hmm. Then the thing becomes rigid. There, there won't be motion. Uh -huh. Okay. So for example, if instead of pentagons, I had been doing a quadrilateral. Okay, and I'm told that say all of these have side length one. Okay, so that's, I guess, a rhombus, right? Then the space of these rhombuses is basically a circle. If I pin down this point, there's an angle, and that angle could be anything in the circle. So that's what I mean by the space of, you know, these rhombuses being a circle. So the space of pentagons, it actually depends on the side lengths. And it could be anything from a two-sphere to the surface of a bagel to the surface of a four-hole bagel. All possibilities. And the regular pentagon... Um, is a point on the four, on the um, on the four hold uh, bagel, okay? And now what we're talking about is motions on these various surfaces, right? We imagine that there's you know that you you know you kick one of the agents and he begins moving and then he begins pulling every you know all the other ones around. And the question is, you want to do the prediction about what's going to happen? How precisely do you have to know the kick that you gave um, that you gave to that uh, you know to that initial agent? How precisely, and it, and, um, what, and it turns out that if you're in one of these situations where the genus is bigger than one, when you have two or more holes, then prediction is impossible. You're having, it's a chaotic system, uh, and, it, and it happens for a very, very simple reason. Uh, so, okay, so I want you to, so here's the surface of a torus, okay, and I put a checkerboard pattern on it, okay, uh, so that it doesn't look so featureless. Okay, and I can imagine having an infinite checkerboard that sort of wraps all around the torus. Okay, and in fact, you know, a, a bug can never tell the difference between whether it's living on the checkerboard and just having a very periodic life, just time after time the same thing happening, or whether it's really living on a torus if it's genuinely periodic. So the experience, if you go ahead and you move around on a torus, there's something about your experience that feels like the checkerboard. Because you remember that, you know, you moved around for a day, etc. So a path on the torus, you know, if I start off with a curve, right, and some motion on the torus, I could, you know, sort of trace out an analogous thing on the checkerboard. And if I think about where I can go in t seconds, I will, you know, get here a ball, I mean, um, a disk of radius t that has area pi t squared. Okay, so that's sort of a quadratic kind of possibilities after t seconds. When you do this on a surface of genus 2, you get something that looks like this. Your ex the experience resembles this. Okay? So this thing here, you know, you have identifications of these various things that become the surface of genus 2. 
okay? And the number of possibilities of where you can go in t seconds is one second you might move over there. Then you have a whole bunch of other possibilities of where to go, okay? And you have exponential growth. So what that means is that the number of digits of accuracy of knowing your initial kick in order to predict some number of days, the number of digits is around the number of days. Okay, so therefore, long-term prediction becomes impossible for this very, very qualitative reason, right? All just based on, you know, and you, you know, just, okay, well, I, I don't want to believe it. <laughs> okay, anyway, and there are a lot of things that go along this way. Uh, there's the Brouwer fixed point theorem, which says that if you have a disk of any dimension, any transformation of it will fix a point, and this has a, number, a lot of applications, uh, say the existence of Nash equilibria, the existence of equilibria for competitive economies and things like this. So, but, oh, so it's wonderful. There are theorems that various things exist, but the question is how do you find it, right? So that's one of the problems, right? Finding equilibria, you know, finding the Nash equilibrium is a hard problem, right? So we have the theorem that says equilibria always exist. How in the world do you find it? Or when topology shows that something doesn't exist, what actually happens? I mean, what, what actually goes wrong when you try to aggregate these things? Something will go wrong, and it, what I, you know, one could argue that the continuity goes wrong, right? In you know, in the rationality, right? Because after all, if you wanted, to, you you know, you would imagine that if I were on a circle, two points, for most points, there's a unique arc that's shorter, that shortest arc, and you would choose the midpoint, right? So the question is, what necessarily goes wrong, you know, when when something doesn't exist, and how many failures are there? You know, can you make things work generically? Right? There are sort of many, many problems uh, which are begged by the qualitative approach. Okay? And you might want to improve topology, so to speak, um, in order to be able to address some of these. Is, is the word singularity uh, an informal word, or is, is it, uh, is it uh, uh, I would like to say, no, oh, no, it shouldn't be something you understand. It should be something that speaks to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think a different, you know, in, in, you know, there are different ways of making precise what singularity means in the different settings. In the way I was just saying it, I was imagining a function and that it was singular in some way, right? And there was imagining that a discontinuity. That implies metric. Right, but, uh, yes, so by the way, so almost, so when I, yeah, so what I will necessarily have to do is, of course, violate dogma and begin doing measurements, okay? I mean, that will be, it will become absolutely essential. Uh, to do such lie. thing, um, right? But, but you'll see, you'll, you'll see, and then maybe you'll ask the question again, you know, at, at the, you know, at, at a later point. Uh, but I have in mind several different things that they, but they all loosely fit into the same philosophy. Okay. So let me, so let me talk about can we make topology more quantitative? And what I'd like to do is actually rather than do these kind of, uh, you know, sort of baby kind of examples that I just did, I want to do a real theorem and talk about its quantitative side, you know, something. Uh, so this theorem is, uh, this is a theorem of Steve Smale, and he more or less got the Fields Medal for this theorem, okay? I mean, it was called the Poincaré conjecture. Um, I mean, it was the same thing. So this is what Smale's theorem says. It says that if you were, okay, so Rn plus 1, okay, so let's just, uh, yeah, that may be a picture. Okay, so we're in some high-dimensional Euclidean space, and we'll consider a ball in that Euclidean space. And inside of the ball, we'll put in what a topologist calls a sphere. Okay? So you know what that is, right? I mean, right? Everyone, it's a blob, right? <coughs> or, or the boundary of a blob, more, more technically. Okay? Okay? So now, Smale's theorem says no matter how complicated this blob is in high dimensions, low dimensions were done much later, Okay? What you can do is you can push this blob to the boundary, always going through spheres. Okay? You're never going ahead and uh, you know, having self-intersections as you do this. Okay? Right? I mean, it's always, always spherical in this very, very loose topological sense. Okay? So that's right. Okay? So every embedding of, this, of the n sphere in the unit ball in Rn plus 1 can be isotoped to the boundary. Okay? So that's, that's the theorem. And we're proud of it. Uh, and you know, when you look at the two-dimensional case, it maybe looks fairly obvious, although when you draw very complicated curves. And in the two-dimensional case, what you could do is you could pump air 
into the disk that the two-dimensional thing bounds, and you could actually push it to the boundary by, you know, by, you know, uh, you know, just making it a balloon and putting the right kinds of forces. Um, and the question is, you know, uh, can one do that in higher dimensions? Is there a simple reason that we could understand for uh, Smale's process? Okay. So, but, so here's one kind of question, right? When you do this, you know, uh, you'd like to know, can I just make progress, right? I mean. I have this thing, can I talk about how, you know, how complicated this embedding is? And can I then prove Smale theorem by just somehow, in some greedy way, constantly make progress, right, on how complicated it is, right? Always make it a little bit less complicated. And that's more or less what works in dimension two. You put on the forces, and there's some kind of stresses, and as the stresses go down with an evolution, you know, it ultimately just becomes the boundary, just gets pushed to the boundary. Okay, so we need some measure of the complexity. So this is one kind of measurement. You look at how far away are you from a point which is equidistant to more than one point. Okay, so if you're on the boundary sphere, okay, that point is right in the middle of the ball. That's equidistant to all the points on the boundary. And for any other sphere inside, right, like here, these two points collide, right, they to something that's equidistant, right? So this is more complicated than the boundary, okay? So this is some kind, oh, so this is a smaller number, so maybe you take the reciprocal, okay? So that would be some notion of the complexity of an embedding, right? And so now that's the question. Do you have to make things more complicated, right? Smale says that you could go ahead and take any of these guys and you could push it to the boundary. How complicated does it have to get on the way? So there's a theorem of Alex Nabokovsky that says that you can't always just get it to improve. And in fact, suppose that you have a complexity C, and you'd like it to be e to the e, oh, oh not mathematician, 2 to the 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 C, where I put here a tower that's 2 to the 2 to the C tall. Right? So really, real, right? So this is some big number. For C sufficiently large, you're going to have to get Somewhere along the way, when you make this thing go to the boundary, you're going to have to make it at least that boundary. Okay? So this is, by the way, a good measure of what, of what Smale's achievement was. Right? I mean, you know, he, you, know he, he, you take these complicated embeddings, and they have to become incredibly more complicated in the, cor in the course of making them beautiful. Right? The boundary is beautiful. Right? And, you know, these things are just... And it's become mind-bogglingly complex, right? I mean, and it's very, very puzzling, right? I mean, usually, well. What does the complexity mean here? Is here, the mean? complexity was just one over the shortest distance <laughs> where normals collide, okay? okay. So, okay, so <laughs> first thing, so I think, so there are a couple of things. <clears throat> do I wanted to participate. So something always exists, right? There's always this way of improving it, okay? However, now that we've analyzed to some extent the complexity, right, uh, it says that we're never going to actually see that method, right? I mean, you're going to have to make it so much more complicated, right, when C is a reasonably small number, like maybe one over here, right? I mean, this number here is, you know, well, maybe for C equals one, you could, but anyway. Pretty soon you're, you're leaving the kind of things that you would ever be able to describe in a computer. If you just think about the number of pixels you would need for things where the collisions are coming so close, right, they'd never be accessible to computation. Okay. So maybe we should, we should try to come up with ideas of observable topology, if such a thing could make sense. Right? Where you, so it, maybe from some point of view, right, that there are these embeddings which, although they can, in theory, be pushed off to the boundary, maybe there's some way of, of making some sense of the idea that we would never observe it. Okay? So here's sort of a positive conclusion, say that things exist. And one doesn't really need to know what all the words are. These are for high dimensional spaces. Okay? The statement is that many, many things exist. So you look at metrics on the manifold, so there's our measurements. Okay, for uh, when you have a manifold and a metric, there's a notion of curvature. Okay, the key thing you 
to appreciate this theorem, that one needs to know is that if you stretch the manifold, the curvature goes down, right? If you take a sphere of radius one, it has a curvature one. If you make it radius r, okay, it will have curvature one over r squared, okay? Whatever, so it, go, it goes down, okay, as you, as you begin stretching it, okay? However, when you, begin, when, when you stretch it, then the diameter goes up. So right, so we're having these two things that are in, that are in opposition to each other, Okay? And the statement is that here, that if you suppose that you were to go ahead and say, my idea of something beautiful is, well, I don't want it to be very, very cur curved anywhere. Okay? And what I'd like to know is that anything that I can do, uh, but that there's no way that I could increase it, that I could uh, make the diameter any smaller. Okay? That I, uh, simultaneously with that. Okay? And so the, the result is that there are many, many infinitely many local minima of this, and you could count them, um, and they in fact grow doubly exponential with what the value of diameter is. So there are huge, huge numbers of these. And it's sort of a little bit antithetical to the way topology works. A, a lot of, well, in, at least in the most naive sense, okay, usually one looks at spaces, right, so local minima, one feels that there's, you should, you're entitled to one per component, okay? And here, the space of metrics has just one component, so you feel entitled to at most one, and there are problems uh, to guarantee even one. So, so what happens is these local minima, it turns out that they want to be new components. Okay, that you look at these different local minima, and in order to connect them to each other, okay, you have to go ahead and produce such long paths that, it, that like in the previous example, you would never actually see them. Okay, so when there's some kind of multi-scale phenomena here. Okay, so these are sort of new, uh, species. Okay, so this is a complicated theorem, and it connects uh, for the theme of you know. So it connects with Smale's ideas, um, and technically it relies on work of Cheeger and Gromov, which who have been you know very very influential in putting quantitative ideas into topology. Okay, um, and what and this and it connects to the work of Gödel and Turing directly um, in terms of. Uh, connections between computational complexity, um, well, just actually even at the foundations of what's computationally possible, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll skip the discussion about the method. Um, yeah, and I, the sort of, what sort of is important in the method, meaning it's something that I just want to say since I'm talking to an audience of scientists, because I've hoped to apply the idea behind this to science, but I have never succeeded. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that occurs here is that these spaces of metrics or these spaces of embeddings end up having inside of them difficult algorithmic questions. And one would believe that these kind of things occur in many, many places, like in economics. If things were very, it's very, whenever there's sort of competition involved, there's some kind of information theoretic difficulty. There are information theoretic problems, right? Because after all, if it were really, really easy to compete with you, somebody would, and then you'd be out of business. So I was always, I, I've, ever since seeing these theorems, I've been hoping that the kind of principles behind these would be able to predict, you know, how many different kinds of cell phones should there be, you know, a, you know, based on, you know, um, you know, because I mean, well, or how many species of beetles are there, right? I mean, you have an ecological niche. You have lots of different ways of trying to optimize something, right? And of course, all of these optima compete very, very well with things that are nearby, right? That could be, you know, like the increasing, right? Imagine that we were charging money for, for the diameter, right? So all of these things would want to be local minima, and you have to increase the diameter a lot, and it's saying that there are many, many of those. And somehow, you know, I, but like I said, this is a failure, but I'm hoping, I, I'd like to advertise it, okay? So the general problem is that topology has many deep theorems. I mean, Smale was, I, Smale was the first revolution, but that was in the 1950s. Okay, Men, there are many, many things where topology proves things very indirectly using mixes of reasoning, and at the end, we don't understand what it is that topology produced. Okay, <laughs> right? Something exists, and will, and in some cases, like in, you know, like in this pre, like in Smale theorem, we'll never understand the thing it produced. But in other cases, we can hope to understand it. Right, and you know, and that yes. I, I, maybe I shouldn't. Please, ask, go ahead. I am lost okay. at the place. There's Smale's theorem, which says that 
something's possible, but it's so, but achieving it you could, is demonstrably so complicated that it's useless. Oh, let's say, let's say, let's say right, 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 yes, yes. And then there was the next theorem. The next theorem. What, I didn't understand why that made things better. Can you just say it? Oh, what it, is it that that next theorem says in English? It, it, okay. <laughs> Show us the letter. Go back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, was, I wanted to sort of draw a picture uh, that maybe would. Okay, it's turning it on, it's turning it on its head, okay, that, uh, you know, you do, um, right? So what this, what this is saying is that when it's hard to, Okay, so let me sort of draw a picture of, of, of uh, better over there. Or, I can't tell whether more people, you know, whether angle is better or light is better. Let's on the left. Yeah, okay. Right? Okay, so, right, Smale says that these kind of things are connected. Right. Okay, and the point of view of the second, topologically, right? So you're looking at these things and that there's nothing, you know, that there's only one thing that can't be improved, right? Namely, the, the boundary, the boundary sphere that has the best complexity, okay? The other theorem is sort of focused on, you know, uh, that, you know, if you're only going to be, say, looking at your re relatively near neighbors, okay, which is the calculus point of view, are you infinitesimally a local minimum, right? Then you only examine these, but if you're willing to even go way, way high, Right, I mean, doubly, multiply exponential, so you never see the things that go far away, right? Another way of saying, so the second theorem is sort of, it's, it's the other side of the same coin. It means that there have to be many, many optima, or from all practical points of view, optima, to certain kinds of variational problems, okay? So these things are focused, you know, so I would think about these as, you know, this as being Samsung, Nokia, you know, et cetera, right? Different. You know, different things that optimize something or other. It happens to be that they're doing the same kind of thing. And if you know, if I would have realized it, you know, ultimately, you know, I well, I yeah, I don't want to tell many stories, right? Because you know, they're not competing very, very nearly to each other, but they're part of the same ecological niche. Okay, does that metaphor help? Does anything I say help? Or <laughs> These sort of folds that we're talking about, uh, do you call them that? <coughs> yeah, so these are, some, you know, so in, in, the very, in, in this theorem, you, you know, you could either be thinking about this for the embedding case, okay? So let's just think about it, you know, so that would be some specific embeddings of the sphere, okay? Right? And now these embeddings, you know, you could think about an embedding, you know, that some embedding is beautiful if it's if it sort of, you know, that any of its neighbors are more complex than it. Imagine we spend energy in order to, you know, that complexity costs energy. And that, you know, I mean, and, you know, suppose that, you know, that these were living, living spheres, okay, right? So at least the local condition demanded by evolution, right, would be that you're a, you know, that you're a local minimum. And that, and then you might actually, you know, with some mutation rate, you might be competing with neighbors at some particular scale, right? You're asking about the stability, right? But if things are going to be very, very, you're constantly losing, you know, um, you know, you're constantly becoming more and more complicated. It's constantly taking you more and more energy. It would take forever, an incredibly unlikely thing to be able to leave from here to there. So maybe that's sort of the motivation for why I think that this could have bearing in some other sciences where there are things with, uh, where, there, where there's some kind of computational complexity involved. Okay, I mean, so well, so, well, so, so much for poetry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me, yes. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is now talk about art, given that poetry went over so well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, okay, I'm not going to tell you what the idea of this picture is. Okay. We all see this picture and, you know, see boats and, and you know, someone on a kayak and trees and stuff like that. Right, but of course, what we're you know, uh, you know, part of part of the gig is that uh, is right is the pontalistic aspect that we're just seeing points, right? We're seeing really samples, 
And we're supposed to be inferring from samples what the space is. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about uh, for the next bit is a little bit of a topological view of that. Okay, so to a topologist, if I have 50 points, 50 points are the same as any other 50 points. It's the space that has 50 points in it. Okay, so obviously you don't want to just be a topologist. If you're going to be studying sampling, you're going to have to, be, you're going to, have to mix topology with geometry in some fashion. Okay? So the question that I want to now do is, so topology and homology and all of those, all of those ideas really assume that you had a whole space there. Okay? And what I want to talk about is, suppose that you don't have the whole space, you just have samples. So then you're going to again be rethinking some of the foundations of topology you know, from, the point, you know, from the point of view where you don't have infinitesimal stuff. Okay? So there's sort of this general sampling problem. Given samples of a space that might or not be well spaced, right, in that picture, you know, or say in a dot matrix printout of things, right, you have very, very well spaced out uh, samples, but in, in life you might not, they might not be uh, uniform. The question is, what can you infer about the geometry of the space? And you might ask, how many samples are necessary? What's the rate of convergence? Blah, blah, blah. There are all sorts of technical questions that you would ask um, about such processes. Okay? But this is sort of another place where taking topology, which you know, gives you all of these you know, uh, methods, uh, could hopefully give you uh, some insights um, into other kinds of space. So for example, the components would correspond to what people statistically do when they talk about clustering. For example, if you're going to be believing uh, dimension, right? One thing might be your data is in a, you know, these points are lying in a very high dimensional space, but maybe it's secretly a sphere that's just a topologist sphere, so it's really something lower dimensional, okay? Um, and in principle, this could be useful for learning because, for example, if you just have two points and one is red and one is blue, right? The standard thing that the machine learners do is they would put the hyperplane that separates them, and that would be their classifier. But if you're aware of the geometry, you might come up with a different classifier, right? Even without any additional labels, right? So the hope would be that for some problems, maybe looking for a hidden geometry will help. It could be that frequently it's useless, right? I mean, it could be that sometimes it would be useful. I want to make major claims. I'd like to just be on occasion useful, and that would already be a big improvement over the past 50 years, okay? Right? So you might be seeing something like this, right? and this is poorly sampled, and you'd like to figure out, oh, that came from a Klein bottle. Okay? So here is a method. This is, okay? So we, what started off with points that were sampled from this annulus. Okay? And you know, so one sees these points, and now what you do is you pick a scale, because you don't know what the scale is, right? and you connect the two, two points Whenever they're with it, whenever those balls overlap, okay. So you go from the points to, in this case, it's not quite a graph. It's a little bit better because there are three points, each of which were quite close to each other. So then I'll fill it in the triangle. Okay. So and if you have four points, I would put in a tetrahedron. So on, the things can become quite high dimensional. And then there's an evolution as you increase the scale, right? So you know this is. You know, the points came from this. You don't see the annulus, right? The annulus isn't, the annulus isn't <coughs> really there. That's just where the points were sampled. You then begin producing this sequence of spaces, right? And each of them could be thought of as a topological object. And you sort of keep track of what's been going on uh, in each of those. Uh, okay? So one way to think about that is you're having the distance to that data set in Euclidean space and you're looking at the level sets of distance, okay? So, and you're trying to inter understand how the holes change as this parameter changes, okay? So, in this one, this is what happens with the zero-dimensional holes. But at this level, there's one zero-dimensional hole. Well, I mean, well, there's not a hole. Okay, at this level, you begin seeing a hole, right? Because there are these two points. I won't tell you this why one. Uh, the, you want to distinguish the empty set, by the way, something that's actually there, okay? And now, however, this difference goes away after a little while, and that reflects the fact that this, this thing here is fairly unstable, right? Only, you, you only have to change the function a little bit, namely this amount, to get rid of, to get rid of this extra, this thing that seems like an extra component, okay? okay? That would be the one-dimensional holes. So here's sort of what happens. I, I put 
points on a bagel. Okay? And then I produce these complexes. Okay, I forget how many points there are, but you could, if you would count the bars, you'd be able to see the points. And then I computed the, this homology. And this is what the histogram looks like. Okay? So these two are there. Those are the fact that the bagel has two essentially different one-dimensional holes. Okay? And the rest is some kind of noise that you see at any particular scale. Okay? So this is some way of dealing with some kind of multi-scale data kind of problems. Okay? So people have usually concentrated on the long bar. They're the most stable, and they correspond to the large features. The small bars, I think, have been underrated in the literature, but they correspond to things like the texture um, of the item. And one could conceivably imagine, you know, say, looking at the surface of pollen of different pollen particles and seeing something really different and interesting statistically in the small in the in the small bar distributions. I mean, I haven't done that experiment for many different reasons. Okay. Okay. But anyway, so there is a theorem that of a lot of people. So in other words, there are many, <laughs> many theorems and many papers by many authors uh, with different models, etc. But they all say the same thing. That with enough samples you can decide if they're coming from a manifold, right? And if so, which one they're coming from. So a manifold I think of as being a reasonable space. Okay? And this is sort of some version of probably approximately correct learning. <laughs> okay? Right? So this notion of, uh, of probably approximately correct was introduced by Let's Valiant. It's sort of a reasonable thing in learning theory. You're getting data, but it might be noisy. And you're not going to ever be correct. So you only shoot for approximately correct. So learning topology means you're only going to be approximately correct. Because topology, that's its nature, right? I mean, it's always this kind of imprecise thing, right? You're only learning about how many holes there are, what dimension it's, right? So even when you're, if you get the topology correct, you're only being approximately correct. And you can never do better than probably, because you might be unlucky and never sample an important part of the space, OK? So that's sort of the best you could do. And there are these theorems that say that one could go ahead and do these. Mathematically, what's sort of important is that a lot of theorems are easy to prove in the limits. And what you really need are epsilon delta statements so that you can work at a fifth scale. Okay? Um, so that's where some kind of quantitative improvement of topology. Topology would have directly implied things about taking a limit, which just would mean that if you were a data scientist and you had an experiment running forever, you would ultimately get the right answer and that you would infinitely often believe that you were right, even though in between be, you change your mind, maybe. But you might be dead. Right? <laughs> Well, even with epsilon delta, you might be dead first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, good news, bad news, stuff like that. So actually, the theorem, you know, as I said, many, many people worked on it, but it, I don't think it's particularly useful. I mean, it's, it's sort of a nice philosophy. I mean, it's a, um, you know, it's sort of a proof of concept. It's a toy model. Imagining that your things were sampled from a manifold and that you have some kind of noise model and things like that, depending on the theorems. Uh, it's, it's, what's sort of more important is the, you, these, these things produce algorithms. Okay? And the idea is to hopefully use the algorithms under situations where the hypotheses don't hold and hope for good things to come out anyway. Okay? And uh, you know, why should that happen? Because we, without luck, Nothing good ever happens. Okay, you know, a, uh, and you know. So, for example, uh, Monica Nicolau and Gunnar Carlson and uh, Arnold Levine applied such ideas to some breast cancer data, and excuse me. Okay, and you know, the output of the data analysis it didn't produce a manifold or anything like it. It produced some kind of funny graph that looked like this. And it ended up having an interpretation that there were some set of patients. I don't remember where they are, or whether, whether they were here or there. there were, this was a set of women who the usual diagnostic test said they had really, really, uh, they looked extremely different than normal, and that they had, should have no chance of survival, and that they had an extremely high 10-year survival rate. Okay? And it was a fascinating result. It means that these are a set of people who are healthy for a non-standard reason. Okay? And the method that that and th this method, this was discovered by thinking about, you know, uh, producing these invariants based on the manifold model, okay, and then looking at what the space that comes out. And this space doesn't look at all like a manifold. I mean, 
I could make a manifold that sort of looks like that if I squint, but why do that? Okay. Um, but nevertheless, you know, this is like a, a case where I feel that the proof of the pudding is in the eating, although I don't know that, that the phenomena that they discovered, this was a PNA paper a few years back, and I haven't followed up to check whether um, this has been verified in later studies. But, uh, well, but, but that's sort of the philosophy behind some of these things. You know, one does these things uh, and hopes for the best. Well, they just found that particular shape. What, what did they learn from that? Oh, so, so, um, so these, I think, corresponded to, these were the sort of the normal, these were the normal patients, okay? And, you know, uh, normal or close to normal so that they were able to respond well to standard treatments, okay? There were, some of these corresponded to, you know, and I think that, you know, before this, it, all of this was sort of viewed as bad stuff. I mean, uh, I'm wondering whether I should find a PN, um, I think that I'll skip other diagrams unless you're really, really curious no. about the way in which things were interchanged. But I think that uh, what they were able to discover was that there's sort of this edge down here, <laughs> which are really, really different kinds of, you know, it's a, it, these women, you, you do certain kinds of standard measurements and they look indistinguishable from all the other ones, but in fact they do a lot better. And it's somehow that their body is able to fight the cancer in a non-standard method, okay? And it was the discovery of these. I mean, so this wasn't leading to a new therapy of anything, but it was hopefully going to be a new diagnostic tool uh, to give some people hope, who previously would have been stuck in, you know, this morass of, you know, you're not really doing very well. well what yes. is a point on that thing represent? Um, I don't exactly remember. I think that this was some kind of um, gene expression data, so it was an abstract point in a very high dimensional space of, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, so it was an abstract space, and then you go ahead and you use some such methods that are motivated by topological clustering. I mean, so there's a piece of software called Mapper, <laughs> then there's sort of, uh, you know, in the course of doing things, you need some function, and it was sort of a very interesting function that they used there. I mean, there were, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is just a, you know, a Okay, I don't want to make the claim that this is just the result of topological thinking, you know, et cetera. I mean, it's a matter of, uh, but it did use this kind of topological way of thinking, you know, and of thinking of this sort. You look at the data and you try to imagine what space this data would be coming from and what would be the geometric features of this space. But it isn't the answer, a point is an individual, and you are answering what is the space, but isn't Yes, I was the answering, point. Point. yeah. It uh, is the individual, in some in the space that you were talking about, right, right. I, except that I made a slight uh, distinction. I don't identify the person with the set of uh, measurements of the person under some tests. But you know, but well, other than that, other than that nuance, right, on the right, right. It's the, it's the right. It's the results of this set of measurements on a person, right, right. That that's what the what the point is. And you're saying that other clustering techniques did not find Right, other te clustering <coughs> techniques did not find this uh, originally. Yeah. Okay, so now let me tell you the bad news, okay? And these are bad news about the original model. And um, it turns out that in worst case measurements of these problems, the actual complexity measures are very large. Despite the original dream, which was that we want to understand dimension, okay? And this really, so let me just sort of, let me just amplify a drop about what this dream was, okay? So, right, I mean, you know, you go ahead and you tell, right, I mean, you're given a space that suppose it's 17 dimensional, right? So the most conventional way to see that something is 17 dimensional would be you say, you might, appro you might approximate it by a 17 dimensional plane, okay? And this is, you know, this is, that's sort of the standard method, principal component analysis try to find a 17-dimensional object that well approximates it. But topologists had a different tool. Locally. Yeah, locally. Right? And you might do it at differently at different points, but that would, you know, but that would be your, 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 your feeling um, about it. And, you know, and that's very, very hard, right? So, because, so that the that, uh, dimension determination requires modeling, so to speak. Okay? Or, I mean, if it turns out to be very, very highly nonlinear, then when you do these things linearly, you fail. Okay? Now, the topologists, you know, I mean, you know, I, and I remember 10 years ago, I, I, I used to use this as being, 
uh, the motivation for this kind of thinking. Topologists have a different way of seeing that something 17 dimensional. What they would do is they would compute homology for every subset, and if it vanishes above dimensions, you know, above dimension 16 for every set inside, then you say, oh, this thing has got to be 17 dimensional. Okay? Right? The, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, that, that would be the method, right? I mean, and, you know, and it doesn't give you any local model. It doesn't say that you're, you're near a plane. For example, if you take my head and you include the hair, okay, that's still two dimensions. I mean, the surface of my head. My, my scalp union the hair, but not union the brains. Okay, just, right? Just that thing, that's a two dimensional object. Although, you know, at, at a follicle, I can't approximate it well by a plane. Right, there's something that sticks out. Still, to a topologist, that's two-dimensional, and you'd be able to measure that without the modeling. Okay, and I thought that that would be great. An experimental scientist would go ahead and say, "I measured 17 different things," and then I would go ahead and I put it into my, you know, put it, put it into the software, and I would say, "Oh, well, all the homology vanished above dimension 13. That's really cool. So that means you have a 14-dimensional object. That means you've discovered three laws. We don't know what they are yet." <laughs> But now you have something that you could ask the theorists. And on, but on the other hand, if nothing vanished, when I was getting homology, well, blah, 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 then I would say, oh, well, there's, there's no interrelationships among these things. There might be some measured theoretic relations or things like that, but there's sort of no laws that underlie it. Okay? So anyway, so that was sort of the, that was one of the initial dreams. And that dream, I think, it was um, a little bit uh, because of the kind of, now that we've analyzed the computational complexity, of these problems, that dream I think what turns out to have been a little bit uh, too strong. Okay, but still, I think the philosophy about looking for topological features um, isn't undermined. There is some good news, by the way, which means that you know it means that things don't get solved in real time. But so you have the following: suppose that I have an object, and it's really only seventeen-dimensional, but I did a thousand measurements of each point. So the way the data is provided to me. You know, it lives like in a point in R1000. It even lives in Hilbert space, okay? Right? It's, right? It lives in this big infinite dimensional object. So at least the theorems say that the complexity measurements that, that evolve only depend on the abstract structure of the data set. So it means that if you had a data set that you really insisted on studying by this, right? And you know, and you made it a research project and you had an institute and maybe several generations to work on it, right? One lifetime isn't enough for any really good problem, right? Then you know, then you could do it, right? It doesn't grow, the fact that you go ahead and you did more measurements and put it in a higher dimensional space doesn't have to confuse you and make it worse. <coughs> okay. okay, so anyway, there are two responses to this, to, this, uh, to this problem, that the fact that you actually, when you do these things, it turns out that they have provably uh, difficult measurements. So the first would be to look for circumstances that make the data set uh, more especially likely to have readily computed invariants. Okay? That would be one kind of thing. Don't try to apply this to all kinds of data. Okay? And that was sort of the, the, the moral of that theorem that I said, that it only depends on the data structure, the structure of the data as opposed to where you stuck it in. Okay? That's sort of a type one kind of solution. But what I'm very excited for the past couple of years about is to change your perspective about what you want to compute. Okay? Rather than study the usual traditional topological invariants, you want to find a set of invariants that actually, by statistical sampling, you can get your hands on. Okay? So this is the issue of testability. Okay? So I like to think about testability. If you want to find the best candidate for a job, you have to interview all the applicants if you actually want to be sure. Even if you're only half the, half into, you know, you know, you want to have a reasonable probability, then you need to hire to check a high a high per percentage of the number of applicants. Okay, so that's sort of like the old topology problem, right? Find the best. Okay, and that's not such an easy thing to do by statistical sampling. If you're only if you're willing to settle for someone who's in the top one percent, then you only have to interview three hundred applicants, and you're ninety five percent sure. And it doesn't depend on the size of your applicant pool. Okay. Right? So this is sort of what, I, so what I'm trying to do is make the same kind of transition in topological invariance. Right? That the usual traditional, you know, that certain of the standard kinds involve things like this that would really be very, very large and require uh, sort of too much data to get your, to get your hands on. Uh, but that maybe think there are things that are more analogous to this uh, where one could uh, get some hope. Okay? So for example, if you were 
taking a tree, okay, the average valence everywhere is two, okay? I don't, oh, yeah, I called the, the, the slide that, that was relevant to, sorry. I knew that I was getting a little too. So here's sort of another interesting one, I think. If you take a three valent graph, okay, so this is, right, every, every guy has three neighbors, and you ask how many cycles does it have, the number of cycles that it has is about one half the valence. Okay, and you write down an exact formula. Okay, so it always has a lot of cycles. Okay, uh, so by the, so of course, if I want to know the number of cycles, right, the number of one-dimensional holes in it, right, then I have to actually know how many vertices there are. I have to somehow take into account <laughs> all the points that there genuinely are. Okay. Okay. Suppose that instead of asking about the, the number of holes, I ask how many, how many holes are there per unit volume, right? So, what the, so then I'm dividing by the valence. So the answer is easy. I told you it's approximately one half b. So the answer is approximately a half, right? Since I told you the answer, okay. It wouldn't have been so hard even if I didn't tell you the answer. So it's a good audience, okay? So now, but what actually happens if you sample this graph? Yes. I'm confused. Is v the does v stand for valence or vertices? Vertices. Or vertices. Oh, it might stand for both. V stands for vertices here. Yeah. <coughs> but I do have the habit of using the uh, naming things after what they sound like. Okay. But this is sort of interesting. If you choose a three valent <coughs> graph at random, and you ask, and you look at it by sampling, and you ask, how many cycles do you see? So I imagine the following. You choose a vertex at random from the graph. Okay, and you look at a ball of some fixed size, like 3,000. Okay, and I ask, how many cycles would I see inside of that? Okay, okay. It turns out that, you know, that you, you that almost you see almost none. Once your graph has more than even the three thousand vertices. Okay, once you're talking about a very very large graph. Okay, most almost there are almost no cycles. Till you get to around log of the number of things. Right. So in other words, so this is very very interesting. Right. The number of cycles per unit volume is non-zero, it's a half. But actually, if you look at, you know, if, but if you actually sample volumes, even large volumes, you never actually see those cycles. So that's, I think, a very interesting kind of phenomenon that's occurring in this graph theory setting, right? Where, you know, there's topology at particular scales, but you don't actually see it. I mean, there's topology forced by what's occurring at some scales. So it's not visible. Right? But you can infer it. I, I like to call this foamless foam, the usual picture that one has in mind of things that have a lot of topology in a little, in a little region is something that looks like foam. Because right? that has lots and lots of you know, tiny bubbles and stuff like that. Here you're saying that, well, this is like foam in the sense that it has many, many, many cycles, but all of them are large. Right? So there's nothing foamy about this foam. And that that's actually the typical kind of behavior uh, that one sees. And that's uh, the kind of topology that I think uh, might be of useful. So my hope is that ultimately <coughs> we want to understand statistically visible topology and study how that interacts with geometry, with information of that sort of texture of data sets, different kinds of things that we've been studying before. So anyway, I, so I guess that 